I'm not a UBI guy, uh, not now. And the reason is basically, it's a lot of money. And uh, given that there are constraints, political constraints, on how much money we're going to be able to get together for social programs, the trouble with UBI is that either it's going to cost an amount that's beyond what I expect to, to be politically possible in, in the next several decades, uh, or it's going to be way inadequate. And so more targeted programs, programs that that focus on people with real needs, and that includes everything from, of course, universal health care, which we could, should you know, do right away one way or another, uh, to uh, various kinds of income supports for uh, families with children and so on. The, there's a whole lot, if, if you ask what we can do with a, a sum substantially less than UBI would cost, it's a lot. And to say, well, no, we must have UBI, that would only make sense if we were right on the verge of the point where the robots take all of our jobs, and that doesn't look, there's no sign that that's actually happening. The starting point is uh, finish the job that the, um, that the Affordable Care Act began. You know, I would, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about this new proposal to uh, ACA 2.0 to reinforce it. That's not the, uh, not, that's not the end point. I mean, I'm a, I'm a Medicare for America guy, which is, uh, Medicare is available to everyone, but you can also keep private insurance, but uh, something like that. But start with, with that. Um, we need aid to families. We need uh, uh, child care. Universal child care is, uh, is something that we're, it's crazy not to have, given what it means for the country's future. There's a, there's a list of things. You start to add up things that are huge benefits to America that would cost a few percent of GDP. And that's a significant but not crushing sum, and we should just do them. You could, you could have a very extensive progressive agenda for no more than the amount of money that a Republican Congress just blew on a completely pointless tax cut, right? Now, Two trillion dollars over the next ten years would buy you a lot of social progress. So let's start from there. Uh, it, it, anything up to that point, I would say, let's not even worry about where the money's coming from. If we're going to have a recession, it's going to be a smorgasbord recession. We know one thing, but just a bunch of different things. I mean, short-run economic forecasting is, is, a, is a black art. Nobody does it very well. For what it's worth, people who are tracking are feeling moderately depressed right now. They're, they're seeing slow growth right now, and the you know, markets, the bond market is acting as if there's a pretty good chance of a recession sometime in the next year or so. But who knows? There are all kinds of things that could be going wrong. China is clearly struggling. Europe may very well actually already be in recession. Probably are suffering the deflation of the tech bubble. Corporate debt has gotten it. I've been saying there's no one thing. This is if, if we're going to have a recession, it's going to be a smorgasbord recession. It's said now that our economy is the strongest it's ever been in the history of our country. Well, even uh, even his own numbers, right? I mean, it's not, he's been boasting about the greatest economy ever, and it actually turns out that we've had the highest growth rate uh, since 2015, right? It's not, it's not exceptional. Uh, what we've been seeing is just kind of a, in the normal range of fluctuations. People don't live on GDP. People live on their paychecks, and paychecks have not at, at best, kept slightly ahead of inflation, and not even that. And it, that's for a long time. It, people, so you say, whatever, whatever people may say about the growth number, the fact of the matter is people are looking and saying, I don't feel like it's any easier to pay my bills this year than it was last year. The absence of faster wage growth, despite low unemployment, is something of a mystery. But, you know, the, the economy is always changing. The way we measure the unemployment rate is always the same, but what it means in terms of how tight our labor markets, how much bargaining power workers have, that can change a lot depending on what the economy is like. And it looks as if we have an economy right now where between weakness of unions, uh, concentration of market power among employers, and maybe other factors we just don't understand, uh, what 
looks like a historically low unemployment rate isn't actually translating into the kind of bargaining power that workers used to have. I, I actually, I think that the answer to uh, what will replace unions is uh, unions. I mean, in the end, something like organize, you know, if union means organized labor that is able to bargain collectively, um, there's a reason that we hit upon that solution. Uh, and it's a solution that we managed to uh, lose a lot of, uh, largely because of uh, a, a political environment that's hostile. I mean, we, we unions are a, a very small factor in the U.S. economy right now, but you know, there's two thirds of the workforce in Scandinavia. So there's nothing about the 21st century that says that you can't have extensive unionization. America has made policy choices that have led to low unionization. Policy choices can change. Denmark is absolutely as exposed to the winds of global competition as America is. Two-thirds of them are in unions. And remember, also, most of our economy, by the way, is services, which are not traded at all. So, no, this is, the, this is an excuse. We made, we made a decision not to have unions in America. We didn't lose them because they became obsolete. The whole question of income inequality and growth is a very tortured one. It's not one with a simple or clear answer. Um, income inequality at the bottom means that a lot of children don't get the essential nutrition, uh, health care, uh, uh, other support that they need to realize their potential. So that's a drag on growth. There is some very ambiguous evidence about whether high income inequality is a uh, hurts consumer demand. I'm not fully convinced of it myself. So uh, I think the reason to be worried about income inequality is not what it does to GDP. The reason to be worried about income inequality is what it does to people, which is ultimately what we care about. We have one amount of controlled experiments. We know what happened when food stamps were brought in. We know what happened when Medicaid was brought in because those were both programs that didn't go into effect all across America at the same time. They, they rolled out across the country. And we can look, we have a, what amounts to an experiment and what happens to children who did get nutritional aid when they were very small. What happens to children who did get adequate medical care compared with those who did not? And 20, 30 years later, they are more productive. They're healthier, more productive, uh, more successful citizens of our society. So there's no question that alleviating hardship at the bottom is good, not just for the individual, but for, you know, for the broader society and for the economy. So we now have a large part of the influential elite in the United States that has simply opted out of public schooling. That has to be really bad for social cohesion. And so those are the sorts of things I think that you really want to worry about on inequality beyond just adequacy of, of, of material standard of living. Uh, are we a society or are we not? And increasingly here we are not. Look, if we take the extreme, you know, the, the, uh, the Cuba at the height of, uh, of Castro's uh, regime where, where your income was the same regardless of what you did, uh, you can't be a card-carrying economist and not believe that that has some adverse incentive effects. Um, but uh, the notion that we are, that this is a prime concern in America right now, is just not supported by the evidence. And look, I would say when we talk about tax rates, it turns out that uh, if you are a person who lives in New York City and earns your income, uh, through you know wages and salary, but you have a high salary, so you're a highly paid New York person. Uh, you probably pay 55 to 60 cents of each additional dollar you make uh, in extra taxes. So we have a pretty high, not as high as uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez wants it to go, or Peter Diamond, the great economist, thinks it should go. But we have a pretty high marginal tax rate in New York. Uh, does this city out here? Um, Look to you like a place where people, you know, just don't really work very hard because taxes are too high. It doesn't doesn't strike me that way. So I, I think we have a pretty good, pretty good evidence that the incentive effects in America right now are not something to be worried about. I think it's one of those things. Any anything to. Uh, prescribe any kind of you know, progressive and some sense social policy, they'll find a way to 
uh, make it sound like an ugly thing. And I think the, I think the reason that redistribution uh, uh, managed to acquire a bad resonance among some people is that they managed to convince, basically convince white people that, that taking your money away and giving it to people with darker skins. You know, that's really what, I, like, that's like a lot of things in America, but that's not, certainly not what experts uh, think of it. Redistribution is collecting money in taxes and using it to finance various kinds of social programs that tend to help people who are more in need. Child care, early development, crucially. That's crucial both for the children and for the parents because we live in a society where, in fact, Lots of people, uh, lots of families require two working parents or you have single parents who, who must work. And I'm not violently opposed to you know, baby bond, things where you give people assets, but the fact of the matter is we are going to be a society in which people, the great majority of people uh, make a living by work, by selling their labor. And so trying to spread asset ownership can help maybe a little bit, but ultimately the, if you, want, if you want America to be a more equal, a more middle class society, uh, uh, you have to be increasing the rewards to work, not giving people assets. That is a genuinely hard problem. I spoke about that, I wrote about that. I mean, there are, there are things I know, I think we know a lot about how to make inequality less. We know a lot about how to make children's lives better and make, their, make them more productive adults. If you ask me what you can do I, I spent my early years in Utica, New York. I got in trouble with the mayor of Utica by saying some of this, but if you ask what can we do to actually make lots of people, it's a decaying industrial city. You want to make lots of people want to move back to places like Utica. I don't know how you do that. Uh, there are, you can try, but the, the historical record of attempts at um, attempts to revive depressed regions, as opposed to helping the people in those regions, which you can do a lot of, but, but actually reviving them is not great. So, uh, you know, there are going to be, there are going to be parts of America that, where it made sense to locate a lot of stuff, uh, given the economy we had in 1890, and there is not a lot of reason to do that in the year 2020. And if people are determined enough to try and stay, uh, then we should give them every opportunity. I mean, we should have things like broadband should be available everywhere. The, the fact that there are broadband deserts in, in a lot of America is, that's unnecessary and unforgivable. But the, so I'm not giving advice to people, but we should make housing affordable. The, you know, if you have an economic dynamo like the city of New York, it shouldn't be a place where only people in the, at the 98th percentile can afford to actually have a place to live.